Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, the research that I'd like to talk to you about today is some of the research work our group has been doing, and I'll say we, um, because the research that I'll present is the result of many outstanding postgraduate researchers and colleagues whom I'll acknowledge as I go along. But what we've been trying to do is understand some of the drivers of declining coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef. And I'm going to talk to you about coral disease. It's been recognized as a major driver of declining coral cover in the Caribbean, as Jeremy so eloquently uh, highlighted this morning. But here on the Great Barrier Reef, it's received comparatively lesser coverage. Now, I know everyone has seen this figure before, um, and we've heard several references to the fact that there has been something like 50% decline in coral cover over the past 27 years. But the point I'd like to make is that in order to understand how to halt this decline, we have to understand the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. In this study, they highlighted that crown of thorns starfish, cyclones, and bleaching were the major drivers of this decline in coral cover. But the study was based on manta toes. And as we heard yesterday in Jamie's talk, there are some issues with this technology. And in particular, it's very difficult to identify disease from a manta toe. Uh, using the same long-term monitoring program at Ames, Osborne and colleagues looked at the uh, causes of declining coral cover based on scuba searches. And indeed, they found that disease did contribute to some of the coral loss that, that we've seen. Um, here, 6.5%, which is um, slightly larger to what they attributed to bleaching, but still quite a bit smaller than what was attributed to cots and storms. But what I would like to, uh, the question I'd like to pose is, are we still underestimating the role of disease in declining coral cover? We know that both crown of thorns starfish with their feeding scars and storms and cyclones cause breakage. They cause injuries, which are the perfect breeding ground for pathogens and those uh, infections then lead to the development of disease. So what are the links between cots, predation, and storms and disease? Now, to have a look at the legacy of, of cyclones and injuries caused by cyclones um, and the connections with disease, this is the results. I'm going to show you the results of a study that was led by Jolie Lamb. Uh, she looked at the prevalence of disease following Cyclone Yassi. Uh, Cyclone Yassi crossed the Queensland coast here, um, just south of Cairns as a Category 5 cyclone, so uh, with wind gusts um, to over 285 um, meters per second squared. And um, there was, uh, she looked at the level of disease prevalence in four regions, two regions just north of that eye of the cyclone, uh, in Cairns just immediately north of the eye in Port Douglas, and then two regions to the south of the eye, Townsville and the Whitsundays. And this shows you what she found in terms of the level of breakage at those four regions. Um, clearly, there was the highest level of breakage and injury here in the region of Cairns, just slightly north of the, uh, of the eye. Next, she, she plotted the um, level of injury that she saw at each of those sites. So there were um, 26 sites there against the disease prevalence at those sites. And you can see there is um, a clear correlation between the amount of breakage that the corals experienced and the level of disease that we, we saw. And this was these were in surveys that were two to four weeks after the cyclone. The main diseases that, that we saw were the ciliate diseases. So this is what we call skeletal eroding band. And these are, um, you can see little black spets, which are the ciliates in the, the live areas of live tissue. Uh, this is brown band, and the brown is quite clear here. These are the ciliates that, that uh, again, engulf the coral tissue and move very rapidly. And you can see by the amount of white skeleton exposed here that this disease moves fairly quickly. But interestingly, we then did a follow-up survey, and you can see here that um, four months later in winter that there was still a relationship between the amount of physical injury that was caused by the cyclone and disease prevalence, um, and it continued to increase. So we saw in even further increases in disease prevalence uh, four to five months after the cyclone. 
But carrying that one step further, the following summer, so 12 months later, again, there was a further increase in disease prevalence at those sites. And in every case, the level of disease prevalence increased um, across those three surveys. And um, we still had this, this correlation between the amount of injury that was detected here immediately following the cyclone and the disease prevalence 12 months later. So I think what this indicates is that potentially some of the mortality that is being attributed to cyclones could in fact also be attributed to disease. Um, and certainly it highlights the fact that injury is an important um, factor that, that we should manage if we're interested in maintaining coral health. Next, I wanted to move on and have a look at crown of thorns and the feeding scars produced by crown of thorns. Uh, again, these represent perfect entry points for pathogens. Uh, and so these are the results of an experimental study uh, that, were done, that was done by uh, Stefano Katz and Joe Pollock up at Lizard Island. And um, this is a fairly straightforward experiment. Basically, there were four treatments. Uh, there were two treatments where the uh, coral fragments were, had had recent crown of thorns feeding scars so that there were uh, exposed lesions. And there were two treatments that had healthy corals added to them. Um, in each of these, these two cases, then there was one case where feeding scars had ciliates, those ciliates that lead to the production of brown band disease added, um, then a treatment of feeding scars without ciliates, a treatment with healthy corals with the ciliates added, and a treatment with healthy corals with no ciliates. Replication at the level of the, um, uh, the experimental bins and also at the level of replicates within each of those bins. And interestingly, what they found is that when you add ciliates to feeding scars, we can see with these dark gray histograms, there is an increase in the area of tissue loss, um, and that is fairly rapid over here three and a half days. So by the end of three and a half days, there was something like 70% of the area of the tissue on those fragments that had been lost in the treatment where they had started out with feeding scars and had ciliates added to those. Um, in comparison, these white histograms illustrate the treatment where they were feeding scars, but no ciliates were added. So it looks like if in the absence of a pathogen, those feeding scars then remain, uh, the amount of tissue loss remains fairly stable through time. The dots here represent the actual linear progression rate of that, um, of the disease progression, which you can see here, uh, increases when you add the ciliates, but the progression is fairly stable again here in the absence of ciliates. Now I haven't shown you the healthy corals, and that's simply because uh, healthy corals either in the presence or the absence of ciliates, there was no development of the brown band disease, no development of lesions, and no tissue loss. So um, I think this uh, helps to, to build a case that some of the mortality, again, attributed to COTS may in fact be caused by disease. But clearly, this is an experimental study, so what we would really like to see is a field study to explore this further. And the opportunity arose just earlier this year um, because I was contacted by Grabrampa because their Eye on the Reef program um, was starting to have a number of reports coming in of a disease outbreak, uh, in this case a white syndrome outbreak, this is the classic sig signature of a white syndrome, um, on Bramble Reef, which is one of the reefs that's closest to Orpheus Island here just um, offshore and a bit north from Townsville. And not only was there, were there signs of this white syndrome outbreak, but there were also signs that, that there was an increasing abundance of crown of thorn starfish. So um, two uh, of, of my group, uh, Ginny Crone and Greg Torta, headed out to these mid-shelf reefs and did uh, prevalence surveys to look at disease and crown of thorns abundance at Bramble Reef, but also at three reefs close by, Walker, Trunk, and Rib. And here are some of the results. Again, this is <clears throat> excuse me, fairly um, uh, recent, unpublished data. But it does show um, some interesting patterns. This shows you the disease prevalence at Bramble Reef, where the, where the outbreak was reported. 
And clearly, yes, we saw higher levels of white syndromes than we typically see on our disease prevalence surveys, but we also saw a diversity of other diseases, so brown band disease, black band disease, and skeletal eroding band disease. Interestingly, um, all of the disease that they saw was on the acroporids, so on, and in particular, on the plating acropora um, group. In looking at the level of crown of thorns scars at Bramble Reef, again, there were um, fairly high numbers of crown of thorns scars per uh, transect area, 120 meters squared of reef area. And again, most of those are limited to on the, on the acroporids, the tabular acroporids. Now, if we look at the other three reefs, um, at Walker and Trunk Reef, there were fairly low levels of, of disease, two to three less, two to three fold lower levels of disease than there were at Bramble. But at Rib, there was a similar level of coral disease as we saw at Bramble Reef. And again, an increased diversity of those diseases. And again, at Rib Reef, the disease was largely restricted to the acroporids. So we see a similar pattern at Rib, as we saw at Bramble Reef. And now if we look at the abundance of crown of thorn scars, we again see that the number of crown of thorn scars is much higher at Rib Reef than it was at these two reefs where we saw low disease abundance and approaching that that we saw at Bramble Reef. So putting this together, we can see that there's a fairly nice correlation between the number of caught scars and the disease prevalence that we saw at these four reefs. So it starts to build a case that there is a legacy um, that of left by these feeding scars. They're the perfect uh, breeding grounds for, for disease. Now, they took this one step further and tagged 50 colonies of these tabular acropora at Bramble Reef. And here's an example of one of the, the colonies, tag colonies. Uh, and you can see here the progression of this disease. In this case, this is black band disease. This is what it looked like where the, um, the edge of the tissue, the disease lesion was on the 17th of March this year. Uh, four weeks later, it had progressed to here. And three weeks after that, um, we see the lesion out to here. We can use these photographs um, and do image analysis and look at the level of, of area of tissue loss through time. And you can see this is the progression of the lesion over seven weeks in these three different surveys. Here's another example of one of the corals that was tagged. This time, this coral had been affected by white syndrome. Here's where the lesion was uh, in the first survey. And so there was a very small area of coral tissue loss. But four weeks later, the lesion had progressed to here. And you can see this is a classic signature of a white syndrome, a very small area, a very recently exposed white skeleton. But as you go back through to where the lesion had been four weeks previous, you see increasing levels of colonization by algae. Now, overall, what was we calculated was there was approximately 18% surface area loss per month on these acropora plates, and that's based on, on those similar measures of, disease, of area of tissue loss on the 50 tag corals. If we now combine that with the fact that 12% of the acropora plates were infected at Bramble Reef and uh, Rib Reef, and we know that 32% of the cover on Bramble Reef was comprised of these plate acroporas, and 70% of cover was comprised of the plate acroporas on Rib Reef. What this equates to is something like, well, more than 2% of the tabular acropora are being lost every month. Now, that may seem like a small amount, 2%, but really, if you do the sums, that if we, we turn the Diath figure of 50% over 27 years into a monthly rate, in fact, um, this rate of 2% would be 10 times higher than what you would need to accomplish that, that coral loss. So I guess I just want to highlight the point that I think we do need to think about disease as one of the contributors to the coral loss that we're seeing here on the Great Barrier Reef. Disease is an insidious driver. Um, it's very easy to miss disease or to think that it's insignificant when you do one-off or even annual snapshot surveys. Um, and it's really only by doing these tag colonies and following them through time that you get an appreciation of the the, the loss of coral cover that's resulting. 
Now, I wanted to highlight one further study here. It has been mentioned. Um, and this was a study that was led by Joe Pollack. Um, and it illustrates the, the links, again, between human activities and disease. Uh, it's based on the largest natural gas project in Australia. Um, it involved the removal and dumping of 7.6 million tons of marine sediments over an 18-month period in the, on the area of Western Australia, so over here um, in the, the Montebello region. And what this study involved was um, looking using NASA MODIS satellite imagery to detect the, the dredge plumes. And you can see here, this is a satellite imagery showing the, the dredge plume um, over this um, period of time. And using that data and integrating over the 18 months, it's possible to, to characterize each of 11 sites in this case as to the amount of time that they were exposed to the dredge plume. And here you can see the distribution of the 11 sites that Joe and his team surveyed. And I should say that that team comprised people also from the Western Australian um, Department of, of Environment and, and Conservation. And here are the uh, sites that we would characterize as having a high impact from the dredge plume right through to sites that um, have much lower impact from the dredge plume, both north of it and, and south of it. And here are the results. Um, this shows you that uh, if we go from those low impact sites through to the high impact sites, we do see something like a 2.5 fold increase in disease overall. So a number of types of different types of diseases, but clearly the major one in these white portions of the histograms are the white syndromes. In fact, they dominate the disease at all sites, but in particular at this high impact site. Now, it's not only these infectious diseases that increase at these areas where there is um, higher dredging plume impact. We also saw increases in other measures that we use of compromised coral health. And that includes things like um, algal overgrowth, uh, sediment necrosis, and bleaching, and so on. Uh, and clearly, there is an enormous increase, a six-fold increase in these other measures of compromised health at the high impact site. Um, as well, a dominance of sediment necrosis, this black portion of this histogram. Sediment necrosis increased um, more than um, 40 times at these high impact sites, and similarly, bleaching increased something like tenfold at the high impact sites. Now, we know that there are various other factors that can be linked to white syndromes. We know that white syndromes can be linked to warm thermal anomalies. So we used a distance-based, multivariate distance-based linear model to try and tease apart which some of the factors that could be driving this, um, this level of disease. Um, and that included all the usual suspects. It included six measures of, of thermal anomalies. It included um, crown of thorn starfish or Drabella abundance, um, as well as different measures of coral community structure. But what we found is that sediment plume exposure days was the strongest disease driver. It accounted for, for most of the variance in these patterns in disease between sites. So I think we have here a clear evidence that um, uh, increasing the sedimentation and turbidity at sites has a clear link to disease. It is something that can be managed, um, and uh, we would are beholden to do so. Now, uh, I wanted to just briefly mention that all of these factors are, are likely to be exacerbated by climate change influences on marine infectious diseases. And this is just a figure that's come out of a, um, a workshop that the research coordinated net Research Coordination Network for Marine Infectious Diseases, uh, an NSF-funded NSF network, um, has came up with uh, a year ago and has just recently been published in the Annual Review of Marine Science. Um, it does highlight that, and we know the drivers um, for, for climate. We've got uh, increasing temperatures, uh, acidifying oceans, increasing extremes in, in storms and um, rainfall events. And whether we're talking about um, an abalone or um, a starfish, 
or corals. We know that disease is an interaction between the host, the pathogen, and the environment. So if we start changing this environment, then we're going to see changes in the host, in particular increased susceptibility to, uh, to pathogens um, and other invasions and range shifts and so on, and we will see changes in the pathogens, which can include increased activity and virulence. Uh, so we need to be aware that climate change is likely to exacerbate a lot of the other impacts that, um, that we know are clearly linked to, uh, to disease. Now, I also wanted to end on a much more positive note, so I've, I've added this in just to drive home the, the point that we do have t tools available at the present that actually do ameliorate coral health, and as a consequence, that's going to have flow-on effects for coral cover. Um, and this, the results of this study, study also um, uh, it further reinforce the message that Jeremy um, was talking about this morning, that in fact, protection from fishing is good for, for corals. Uh, and in this study, again, led by Jolie Lam, um, she surveyed coral disease prevalence at um, 42 sites, 11 of those were in green zones, so reserves that are protected from fishing. 11 sites um, in the blue uh, habitat protection zones, which are, fishing is allowed. And then 10 sites in the conservation zones where there is fishing allowed, but with gear restrictions. So just one hook line and, and rod per person. And this study um, was done in collaboration with David Williamson and Gary Russ, who were looking at the efficacy of marine protected areas for, for fish communities. And so Jolie looked at disease prevalence at the same sites. And what it shows is very dramatic that there is, again, um, uh, in fact, here a 4.1, a 4% increase in disease in the fish zones in comparison to the reserves. So um, we have very clear evidence that these reserves are good for coral health. Um, and as I said, there will be flow on effects in terms of coral cover. Now the diseases that um, were particularly um, prevalent in the fish zones were these first three. There were all of these zones, uh, all of these disease types, but in particular, the scleral rotting band, the brown band, and white syndromes. These first two types of diseases are the ciliate diseases, and I've just shown you evidence that um, those ciliate diseases can be uh, promoted and enhanced by breakage. Um, and I've also just shown you from the dredging study that white syndromes in particular are linked to sedimentation. So looking at the patterns and the disease types, we start to gain an appreciation for some of the drivers between these, um, the patterns in these two different types of zones. Um, again, doing a multivariate analysis, um, we looked at 31 variables that could be accounting for this difference in patterns, including the, the length of fishing line in the different um, fish versus reserve sites, breakage, um, coral, um, coral fish community structure, again, as well as uh, thermal metrics and, um, and drapella and crown of thorns. So of those 31 variables, protection from fishing was the strongest driver overall. Uh, again, there was a further um, um, explanation from coral, uh, these other factors, coral damage, fishing lines, sediment necrosis. They also contributed to the differences between the reserves and the fish sites. But overwhelmingly, the, the strongest factor driving these patterns was protection from fishing. So I think, again, the message is quite clear. If you reduce the direct impacts of fishing, then you reduce coral disease, increase coral health. So basically, the, the take-home messages that I'd like to leave you with is that disease prevalence is positively correlated with injuries from cyclones, and that can be for at least one year following a disturbance. It's positively correlated with feeding scars following crown of thorns predation, and those the, the disease that follows a, a feeding scar can have, uh, can cause significant coral loss in the following months. And we can see that disease prevalence is positively correlated with sedimentation associated with dredging. And I should say that that paper has been accepted, will appear in PLOS One in 12 days time. There's been a lot of interest in that paper. Um, and uh, I'd also like to say that climate change factors are likely to increase coral susceptibility susceptibility to disease, 
Uh, and finally, that protection from fishing in MPAs is good for coral, so we do have the tools um, to ameliorate coral health. And with that, I'd like to thank an outstanding and dedicated team of postgraduate students and surveyors, excellent collaborators, and a number of funding bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you.